Okay, good. So, uh, welcome. And uh, I would like to start this, uh, this talk by really thanking Andreas to, for inviting us, all of us here, and also me in particular. And I'm very excited to see this center um, in its creation and, uh, in, and, and the research that is already coming out of it. So it's really very interesting uh, for me. So I would like to spend a few words on a, on a particular topic that I'm interested in, and that concerns the control of, of spins at the nanoscale. And uh, really, there are, there are many uh, spin systems uh, that we are trying to consider, or let's say not even spin system, two-level system or qubit systems, that we are trying to consider as basic building block for quantum information processors. I mean, they range from, you know, uh, cold atoms and ions, superconductors, quantum dots, and, and many other things that we have seen. And also uh, color centers and diamond, which are sort of of particular interest to, to me personally. And all these systems, as we have seen, in various talks already, um, of course, they do couple to their environment. That's completely unavoidable. Uh, and in particular, that's unavoidable when you're going and immerse them uh, into a solid state uh, host, basically, because then there's really stuff around, and that stuff tends to couple to your qubit, and you have to deal uh, with this particular uh, situation. And um, so that's, that's what I'm going to discuss a little bit in, the, in this lecture. Um, I will, I will discuss simply some aspects of methods uh, for dealing with system environment interaction and for methods for cutting out this uh, system environment interaction and how to make those robust and energy efficient because that is of interest to some of the applications that I have in mind uh, later on. So most of my talk will somehow be motivated by color centers and trapped ions where I've used these, these very same techniques as well but in principle they are applicable to all of those. And um, one, one further um, motivation for this whole thing comes from, from this. And at some point, of, by now six, seven years ago, I was wondering whether it's possible to build a quantum simulator that does not have to be held at, uh, in ultra-high vacuum or cool to liquid helium temperatures um, and does not need fields to hold the, the constituents in, in place. And I, I was wondering whether it might be possible to build a, um, a quantum simulator made out of nuclear spins that are chemically bound to the surface of diamond. And then uh, to manipulate those systems um, using some kind of uh, an NV center that is close to the diamond surface, close to these nuclear spins. And these nuclear spins, because they are so close to each other, only about two and a half angstrom or so, actually have a quite strong interaction. I mean, I mean, relatively strong, seven kilohertz. It's not like these gigahertz that we are talking about now, but still, it is an interaction that is much, much faster than the decoherence rate. And in principle, such a device could work at room temperature and without vacuum and, and, and all these things. So that's, that's kind of the thought. But of course, that means that now we have to be able to manipulate um, these spin systems here. We have to control uh, the interaction in those systems, but also we have to be able to initialize it and read it out because it's not such a large a nuclear system that you can just use standard NMR for it. And so the way we, we would envisage this would go about in, uh, roughly in the following way. So we would think we have these nuclear spins on the surface, and then we first shine in radio frequency fields to uh, extinguish or to remove the interactions between the nuclear spins. And then we want to use an electron nuclear spin interaction between the NV center and those nuclear spins to extract entropy and cool those nuclear spins to the individual ground state, all of them pointing down. And then we would sort of start and remove gradually switch off these radio frequency fields so as to gradually switch on the interaction between the nuclear spins and therefore adiabatically translate the initial state, all spins down, of, an, of a non-interacting Hamiltonian to the ground state of a interacting Hamiltonian, namely the one with the, inter that, with the interaction between the, between the nuclear spins. And now you can actually arrive at different strengths and different uh, types of, of radio frequency fields, and this will drive you to different types of interactions between the nuclear spins. And you can, at least theoretically, of course, arrange it in such a way that you might get different 
kind of uh, ground states or different Hamiltonians that have different, really different ground state structures with different magnetization, different structure factors, and so on. And these um, we would envisage to read out with the NV center. And then it would look like this if everything goes well. We start with the cooling procedure, then with the adiabatic transfer, and in the end we make these measurements, and we will see, depending on the, the state that we arrive at, a large a st structure factor of this type or that type, and that's really sort of an uh, indicator of different quantum phases in this magnetic system. Okay, so that's the theory. I mean, we, we worked this out very detailed, but of course it really depends also very significantly on our ability to do this um, read out at the end, namely taking some NV center and measuring a very small number of atomic spins, nuclear spins, and their internal state um, in the presence of potentially of noise. And also it depends on our ability to in the initialize the nuclear spin state at the beginning. And this is really a task that, that, that we want to, to look at. And another motivation for that is that actually came out of this work was to, to say if we can sort of polarize a fixed system of nuclear spins on the surface, maybe we can also take a liquid above the surface containing molecules whose nuclear spins we want to polarize using NV centers just underneath the diamond surface. And again, for that actually now the, the, chance, the, the challenge is even larger because now these molecules are actually moving around so you really have to think how can you get a strong, robust interaction between the NV centers and the nuclear spins. And that's that's again, that's a challenge that we have to address. And if we can do that, then this can really be useful for something like that, where we create sort of liquids that are nuclear spin polarized, we inject them into people, and then these liquids, because of their strong polarization, would give a much stronger MRI signal, for example, that could be useful in medical imaging applications. So that's kind of, the, I will not give any more detail, I mean, we're very interested in, in realizing something like that, that's kind of a dream, but now I want to go to the more mundane task of actually looking at electron spin, nuclear spin interactions. So, what do we have to do? The first challenge here is that nuclear spins and electron spins have a very different energy scale. Very different. So, a thousand times different. And so, you have here your energy levels from the electron spin, here your nuclear spin, and then to equate these uh, energy scales, you have to do something active. And that means here you have to actually introduce a driving field, for example, driving field on resonance here, such that the energy difference um, in the rotating picture with this driving field is actually reduced and what you get is stress states whose energy splitting is proportional to the Rabi frequency of the driving field here. And therefore, by changing the Rabi frequency, you can adjust this energy splitting to the energy splitting of your target system, the nuclear spins, and if you equate this, you have a resonance and you can get, in principle, excitation transfer between the systems. And what really happens here is that you flip the electron spin and you take a microwave photon out of the driving field and this, together with the energy from the nuclear spins, make up the transition frequency in this system. So that's really what is happening here. So the, it is actually important that, this, uh, that, the, that you really have photons, microwave photons in this system to make this thing happen. So if you have this setting, then you have, you have your Rabi frequency, you adjust the, the energy splitting, and then you can really have a situation where you initialize your electron spin in the spin down state. Now it interacts with the nuclear spins that might be highly mixed, so either they're pointing up or they're pointing down. If they're pointing down, then by energy conservation nothing will happen. If this an nuclear spin points up, then it will go down and the electron spin will go up. And therefore, we transfer the polarization or the, the, the entropy from the nuclear spin into the electron spin. And then we can clean up the electron spin in the NV center by simply uh, using a laser pulse to initialize the system again. So in that way we have we can build, sorry, we can build um, um, a fridge basically that transfers nuclear spin polarization via the electron spin into the photon field, which has at room temperature very low polarization. Very similar things you can do with ion traps. You just replace the nuclear spin target, in this case, by simply a harmonic oscillator degree of freedom, which again will have a frequency of a few megahertz, and you play exactly the same games. And this can actually also be useful to make very robust quantum gates and ion traps. Um, well. 
Okay, so now, does this work? And of course the answer is yes, this is uh, very well possible. So we tried this out in, an, in, an, in a diamond system where we had an NV center surrounded by just nuclear spins with natural abundance. And we ran exactly such a protocol. We polarized the NV center, we, we switch on the, the, Rabi, the microwave field drive, establish a resonance, transfer polarization, repeat this many times until the nuclear spin ensemble here is actually polarized. And so this really worked in the experiment and in some such a way that the neighboring nuclear spins were very highly, probably more than 90% polarized, actually, which is kind of nice. But of course, this is not really what we want. We want to polarize something on the surface, not inside of time and close, close by. We really want to bring NV centers close to the surface and then polarize something on the surface or above the surface. And that's a much harder task, partly because these NV centers at the surface will now be much more irregular. I mean, they will have suffer strain and noise from the surface and all these sort of things. And so you really have to think now very carefully how you um, manipulate these NV centers. So you have to decouple them from all those noise sources. And so again, so for that, um, I, I already explained how to do this. We switch on a driving field on resonance. We establish stress states. And these stress states are more stable against environmental decoherence. But now, imagine, well, actually, the reality is you take your microwave source and it's not perfect. Actually, its intensity will fluctuate a little bit. Okay? And so, for example, in, in Fyodor Zelezko's lab, I mean, the microwave sources that he used, they had maybe 0.5% uh, or so intensity fluctuations in amplitude. Yeah? And, and, and so now the question is, what effect does this have? Well, it has a very simple effect because if you think about it, oops, this is not long enough here. Um, this energy splitting here depends on the strength of the Rabi frequency. If the Rabi frequency fluctuates, this energy splitting will fluctuate. And if this energy splitting is fluctuating, this looks to you, if it's a random fluctuation, like a dephasing operation. And so that means that if the Rabi frequency fluctuates, this stress state qubit, is suffering extra dephasing. And you want to get rid of that without ideally, ideally without buying a new better microwave source that is much more expensive but has a much uh, smaller intensity fluctuations. Let's try and see what we can do if we have exactly the same microwave source but we use it in a more clever way. And um, well, how could we do this? Well, if the, the int microwave intensity fluctuations here introduce micro dephasing, why don't we introduce another drive here between those two dress states such that by driving those, we average out the impact of the microwave intensity fluctuation. So this is what we have in mind. So we will get another drive here and this would give new uh, dress states. So now, what does that mean? I mean, now here I'm talking already in an interaction picture and I have a drive in this interaction picture. What does this mean in the lab frame? What this means is simply that I have the primary drive and I have two additional drives whose frequency is detuned by the Rabi frequency of the primary drive. Okay. Then in the interaction picture, this one vanishes, this one is left over and gives these ones. Okay, so the idea here is we put sidebands on the source, the very specific frequency choice and a very frequent uh, um, 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 and a very small intensity, such that in this in an interaction picture where all these driving fields are gone, we have very robust uh, states. So now the mathematics shows that this works. The question is, does this also work in experiment? And this is what we tried out. Uh, Sorry, I mean, maybe what I should say is also what this in the, the end means is that you make a frequency modulated microwave, basically. That's all. And so here's an experiment that, uh, that uh, we, we, let's say, uh, we, we proposed, but Friedrich Letzko, of course, carried out. And so this was an, uh, an, an MV center inside of a diamond surrounded by nuclear spins, which actually caused dephasing. And we switched on a strong microwave drive to average out the influence of the, the nuclear spins. So 
their dephasing in, uh, in, uh, contribution has been averaged out completely. But we still see that the, the, that the coherence sort of drops off quite rapidly. And that was because we chose to, uh, a very strong microwave field, 40 megahertz roughly. And um, together with the typical amplitude fluctuations for this field, you indeed would expect roughly a T2 time of the dress state of two and a half microseconds. So we see exactly what we expect. The, the amplitude fluctuations kill our coherence to some extent. And now we simply switch on these extra sidebands with an intensity that is about a thousand times smaller than the primary driving field. And then we see this. Now we see a beating signal because we really have a very complicated driving structure with several frequencies. But you can see that the beating lasts much longer. And now if you back this out and you analyze what does this mean for the, uh, in the end, as the coherence time in the system, you actually find that the coherence time has increased by a factor of 10. Just simply by adding a very, very weak but well-chosen sideband to the driving field. And if you analyze this more carefully, then you will see T2 times here, ratio of driving strengths, and you see when you have no extra driving field, you have uh, no extra sidebands, you have two and a half microseconds, and you can bring this up to about 25, a little bit above. And then when it, the extra driving fields become too strong, they themselves start to introduce noise and you kill the system again. Now, this can be iterated, so in principle, by just putting more sidebands, you can gain more and more robustness from the same microwave source. Okay, so that's a little game. But then uh, we, we're actually thinking uh, a little bit further. And we're asking the question, another limitation that is typically uh, uh, applicable in these experiments, namely, it is not always easy to apply an arbitrarily strong microwave field. Typically, you have, have some structures that you build around the NV center that uh, carry a certain current. And if you put too much current, they just burn and that's it, and uh, they break. Now, therefore, it is actually a challenge to make very strong microwave fields and also to create microwave fields at a very high frequency. I mean, typically it's nice to go in this three gigahertz regime, but imagine you want to use NV centers to interact with nuclear spins when the external magnetic field is 10 Tesla or so. Then you need much, much higher frequencies. It's much harder to, to achieve this. And you need a lot more power to do so. So is it actually possible to achieve um, control of, let's say, nuclear spins, let's say in a strong magnetic field, where really the splitting of the, of the energy levels of the nuclear spins is much larger than the splitting of the dress states that you can achieve. Yeah. And this can be either because the magnetic field is too strong or because we simply have a power constraint on our microwave. So what do we do then? Now, the situation like this, when the dress stays out of resonance with the nuclear spins, means that you will have very little action here in, in terms of transitions or exchange between excitations between nuclear spins and electron dress states, so it's like that. And the reason is really because they are out of resonance, so at the beginning, the electron tries to accept some of the excitation from the nuclear spin, but then they run out of phase, and instead of continuing to accumulate, it actually gives it up again, this excitation, and returns it to the nuclear spin, and you get these kind of oscillations. So if you're clever, and here you flip the phase of the, new, of the electron spin, you can actually build a system where this excitation exchange is always constructive. Right? So at the moment when you, the electron spins tries to return the excitation, you just flip its face by pi, and then it does the opposite, it accepts even more. And so this is one thing that you can, that you can do here. So you can simply flip the face of the driving field rapidly, exactly at the frequency, at the Lamo frequency of the nuclear spin. And then although you're not really on resonance, your driving field is far too weak, you can still get an effective accumulation of transfer of population between the system and then you can make really control of the, of the nuclear spin. And that works nice and well, but you pay a price. If you do this, you can indeed get an interaction, but it takes a small hit because it's, it's reduced by the ratio of basically the energy splitting here and the energy splitting here. So the interaction gets weaker. Okay. And now you can say, okay, so nothing is really gained because in the end, I mean, I just have to wait so much longer and I expend just 
just the same amount of energy as I would have done uh, before. And so let's analyze the situation a little bit more carefully because this is not the case, this is not true. So here is the unmodulated scheme, so you need a certain time. If you are on resonance, you need a certain time to exchange a, a quantum of, of excitation and you have a certain power to do uh, for this and this is just the, the Rabi frequency which is equal to the nuclear Lamor, so the intensity is squared and that's the power. So the total energy that I need to exchange one quantum of energy is just given by time multiplied with the, with the power. So how it is in the modulated scheme? Well, you need a longer time to accumulate, so to transfer the excitation, but you need much less power and the product of the two is the total energy and what you will find is that omega is much smaller than uh, omega 2 is much smaller than the Lamo frequency so as a consequence now actually you can get the same excitation transfer with much less energy so in principle if the systems were completely noiseless you could actually achieve this population transfer without expending any any energy for as long as the assumptions in your Hamiltonian are correct. But so you can really save a lot of energy achieving exactly the same task by modulating in a clever way your microwave source. So again, same microwave source, you can get much more energy efficiency out of that. And uh, that is true when the interaction is coherent. If the interaction is incoherent between electron spin and nuclear spin, then you actually take, then this has to be squared here, and then actually there's no advantage in the average energy. Just the peak power is smaller, but the average energy is the same. So it's very important in situations where you have a coherent exchange of excitations. You can actually use these modulation schemes to save energy. Okay, so now. I would like to, for the last few minutes, I would like to also discuss one other aspect of these decoupling schemes, and that is, so far I've really spoken about continuous driving fields, and they are great for, for many aspects. They actually, I find them always very easy to understand how to, you know, modulate them and how to change them in order to get the desired interaction. And it also turns out, as I will show you later, that they're actually very energy efficient, but in practice they also have a downside, namely if your Ravi frequency is off, you very quickly use your resonance condition and uh, you stop your interactions and then you have to play this modulation game. So in NMR, for example, people tend to prefer, um, you know, uh, 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 pulse schemes, um, which are much, much more robust to um, to, to intensity fluctuations. And so this is really um, next point here. So uh, as I said already, so if the Rabi frequency changes, then, you then this energy splitting changes and you lose your resonance conditions. So you want to actually, you know, in some way, want to have a large Rabi frequency. And so what you have to do is, you really have to go to pulses where you make very short pulses with very high Rabi frequency and these, each of these pulses creates a pi or a pi half fluctuation, uh, uh, rotation, and then you have waiting times in between. And the waiting times in between, those, uh, those are times that you now have to adjust to match exactly the period of the Lamo uh, rotation of the nuclear spins, and then you actually get resonances again. And so this is completely well known, I mean, this is nothing particularly new, but then you can play all sorts of games by taking these pulses and in a very systematic way you can create new Hamiltonians out of basic pulse sequences and this is uh, one of these examples where we use an XY sequence which is a very standard dynamical decoupling sequence actually. You can take this as the basic starting point, you put in a few waiting periods and, and pi pulses and so on and uh, if, you, if the computer would go ahead you would actually in the end get a flip-flop Hamiltonian between the nuclear spin and the electron spin. And this can be done in a very systematic way and can be constructed in this way. And the nice thing is now, if you have a small power fluctuation, it doesn't really matter so much because um, your, your pi pulse will still be approximately a pi pulse. And also if you have a detuning between the driving field and your electron spin, if this detuning is smaller than the Rabi frequency, you will still implement very good pi pulses and therefore this sequence is quite robust. But now, it's kind of, well, I mean, this is the, again the theory and then in the experiment you can see that this is a continuous driving field sequence 
uh, is not very robust against the tuning and these pulse sequences are much, much, much more robust. But what I'm interested in here is more the question, how much energy do I need now? And now if you go through the analysis, you will see actually that these pulse sequences typically need a lot more power, peak power, but also a lot more energy on average. So if you don't have any problem in providing this energy, then it's, then it's fine. But as soon as you're energy limited, it's likely that this is not, the, uh, typically this is not the way forward. And again, you can just see this very easily. You take the, the Hartmann-Hahn resonance, you compute the energy um, consumption, and then you also look at the pulse sequence. And the, really the key is that if you want to make a pi rotation, you need a Rabi, in, in a time tau, you need a Rabi frequency, which is inversely proportional to the time tau. That means the energy, uh, the, the power is inversely proportional to the square of the uh, uh, time tau. And if you want to do this several times, then let's say over a certain period of time tau, then the energy actually grows like one over tau. So it actually, the shorter the pulse is, the more costly everything becomes. And uh, so then you can, you can analyze this more carefully. So it's really, this trade-off is you gain robustness by pulses, but you pay for it by a large energy consumption. So whenever you're constrained in energy, you should really need more continuous wave schemes to dynamically couple your, your system. Now, we tried this actually experimentally, and there we took nanodiamonds, and we inserted them into a cell. And the reason was that if you take nanodiamonds and you insert them into a cell, you really want to use driving fields that are not too strong, because if you have very strong microwave fields, you might get absorption, and this is not very healthy for your, for your cell. So in this really realistic, practical situation, we wanted to see how much protection against decoherence could we get for, so to speak, a unit of energy. And so this is the, basically the outcome that you are getting. Here we use the pulse scheme, and we look here, the, here's the T2 time that we can achieve, and here's, well, we call it effective Rabi frequency. That's really the mean energy that you are expending. And you see that uh, you expend more energy, and the, the, the coherence time doesn't actually rise very much in this particular experiment, while for the continuous wave scheme, it actually is such that you get a large, much longer coherence time for the same amount of energy. And that, I think, is, is of practical relevance, especially in these biological applications where you really want to have as little as possible absorption in the, in the system. And, um, okay, so this was particular uh, pulse sequences that we used here. That even these pulse sequences, we tried to optimize them for energy, but, I mean, uh, it's clear that there's almost an order of magnitude difference in the achievable coherence times. Okay. Now, there are tricks where one can also deal with this, um, and I, I really have to, two minutes left, so I cannot really do very much here. What you, can, what you can do is actually you can take each one of these pulses and modulate its amplitude for the duration of the pulse. And this, I mean, you can actually even write down analytically. And what you will find is the following. If you have a pulse that has originally a length that is much longer than the Lamo period of the nuclear spin, then the effective interaction that you gain from this pulse sequence for transfer excitations from electron spin to nuclear spins drops off like one over the square of the length of the pulse. And that's bad, again, if you have strong magnetic field, high LAMO frequency, you cannot make very short pulses, perhaps you get weak coupling. Now, what you can do instead is now, you take one of these square pulses, and it can be very long, if you modulate the intensity in a clever way, and you can write this down analytically, you can make sure that the global effect of this pulse from beginning to end is exactly the same as a zero length, infinitely intensity pulse right at the, at the middle of the, of the long pulse. And so in that way, you can actually now take very long pulses, you can reduce the overall intensity and therefore again save energy uh, in the process, or you can simply 
do sort of electronuclear interaction at very strong magnetic field where the Lamo frequency is very large. Okay, and um, so, I mean, theoretically we showed that this, this works and experiments are underway for this. Um, so with that I would like to close and really, um, I think it's a very interesting problem to take spin degrees of freedom, two-level systems, in a variety of environments and use driving fields in a very clever way, ideally analytically constructed and not merely numerically sort of optimized, where one often doesn't understand what's happening, and use this to really make controlled electron nuclear spin uh, interactions. And the applications that we certainly have in mind are um, building a quantum simulator, or 2D nuclear spin systems, having um, a system where we uh, make nanoscale NMR at high fields, for example, but also induce polarization of liquids near surfaces, which we can then inject into people to make MRI imaging. And with that, I would like to close because my time is now exactly at zero. So this, this is the team. Um, these are the people. These are the people that contributed to the various topics that I spoke about recently. Now, this is a slightly older picture. We are a few people less now, and therefore I would like to do this. We are hiring theoreticians. So if you are interested globally in this question of, you know, color centers in diamond, how to manipulate them, how to apply them in biological imaging and MRI imaging and all these sort of things, talk to me. Uh, we are really looking forward for new people to join the team. Thanks. All right.